In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The first few words in the Gospel of Mark state plainly what the reader or the listener is in for. Chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark is the only gospel explicitly called a gospel, an account of good news. Matthew begins with a genealogy, Luke with an orderly account, John with celestial poetry. Mark, on the other hand, gets right to the point, and according to him, the gospel of Jesus is a non-stop riveting enterprise of teaching and preaching, healing and casting out demons, clashes with the powers that be, all fueled by the instant celebrity status of this man from Galilee. The gospel of Jesus, according to Mark, is an urgent, relentless sprint to proclaim the kingdom of God, to heal broken bodies and broken spirits, and to strip the evil forces that rebel against God, to strip them of their power. And word spreads fast, and crowds immediately start to gather, so that wherever he goes, he is surrounded by people who travel great distances to bring sick friends and family to him on stretchers. And when he tries to go home, the crowds grow so great that he cannot even eat. And so many bodies press in on him while he's teaching by the Sea of Galilee that Jesus' disciples have to put him in a boat so that he can keep teaching without getting crushed. And now at the end of a long, long day of shouting parables from the rocking deck to the clamoring assembly on shore, is it any wonder that Jesus collapses onto a cushion in the stern of the craft and falls dead asleep? The minute Jesus lands on the other side, he'll be right back at it. It's all moving so fast, and Jesus' disciples struggle just to keep up, to keep their teacher fed and safe, and to get some clarification for themselves on the astonishing things he keeps saying. And this short, marine voyage from one side to the other. It should be a chance for Jesus to rest and for the disciples to regroup. But no sooner does Jesus fall asleep than this huge storm kicks up. Now remember that a good number of Jesus' disciples are fishermen by trade. They make their living on this body of water in good and bad weather. They know how to handle a boat. But this is no typical summer squall. Wind and waves seem to fight each other. They batter the vessel and swamp the deck. The boat is sinking. And Jesus sleeps on until the disciples wake him, angry, scared, saying, teacher, don't you care? And with the same words that he uses to cast demons out of a tormented soul, Jesus calmly and decisively casts out the powers that threaten him and his people. And if the disciples were frightened by the storm, it's nothing compared with the awe they feel as Jesus speaks to the wind and the water and these forces of nature are suddenly stripped of all their strength. Who is this? He's not just a teacher, not just a healer, but someone in command of the entire natural world. Who is this? Well, we know that he is the one, the one announced in the very first verse, in the first chapter of Mark's gospel. Jesus is not just a charismatic healer and a teacher speaking with authority. Jesus is the very son of God. And yet, it is here, it is in Mark's gospel, the only account of Jesus' life call, that calls itself the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It is in Mark's gospel that the disciples of Jesus are so painfully slow 
to comprehend his identity as the son of God in spite of all evidence. And as a modern Christian, I find this both frustrating and eminently logical. Because honestly, why, why would the son of God, the tamer of storms at sea, exorcist extraordinaire and miracle healer, why would he choose to hang out with a bunch of blue collar fishermen and tax collectors? Why would he run himself ragged preaching to the masses? Some might say the unwashed masses for hours and hours on end. Why would he make himself so vulnerable as to fall asleep in the eye of a hurricane? Why would he give up so much, everything in fact, for us? Well, Jesus' disciples knew the book of Job better than most of us. And they know the story's dramatic climax and unmistakable conclusion is that God is God and we are not God. Human beings will always struggle to make sense of why bad things happen to good people and we will try and we will fail to know the difference between fairness and justice in the eyes of God. And while the designers of our lectionary no doubt paired this lesson from Job with our gospel text because of the storm, <laughs> the storm imagery, we may detect a hint of that wider message on Jesus' tongue after he stills the storm and turns to his incredulous disciples. In the book of Job, after 38 chapters, of Job's suffering and Job's friends arguing with him about righteousness and punishment and divine order. Unsatisfied, Job continues to lament and defend, and he dreams finally of taking God to court with an impartial judge that would hold God accountable. And at last, God speaks, saying to Job in essence, if you are going to question me, and demand answers from me, then before we get started, I have a few questions for you. Where were you when I built the entire universe and everything in it? And we hear just 11 verses of God's speech this morning. But in Job, it goes on and on. It lists in thrilling detail. Um, and I would say maybe delight, the glorious mysteries of creation even after Job actually puts a hand over his mouth, God keeps going. Yes, yes, there is chaos in the wild wonder of creation. Chaos, it seems, is part of God's generative and magnificent order. It is woven into the design. And because of that, we are pulled into new roles as navigators in our own right as travelers and authors and architects made in the image of God and yet not God. You know that many, many churches, including ours, are designed to look like boats, like um, church ceilings with exposed wooden beams, could be the keel of a ship turned upside down, and the space underneath it where the people sit is called the nave, after the um, Latin navis for ship word for ship. So church as a boat recalls Noah's Ark, uh, a vessel of salvation and new life, as well as the fishing boats that feature prominently in the Gospels and the New Testament, as um, the story unwinds of the, <laughs> the setting sail of the early church. So today we are outside the main cabin of our ship, and yet the sails in our trees remind us that we are voyagers with Christ. And for reasons we cannot fully understand, God chooses to accompany us both in times of dead calm and in times of great tumult. We are journeying, we're journeying, we're risking. We are stepping off of dry land and out onto the water. 
And we may wish at times for a more placid and predictable arc of life, but it is not to be. Still, the poignant question asked by Job to God and of the disciples to Jesus, don't you care? The answer to that question is a resounding yes. It is perfectly acceptable for us to ask God that same question when we are suffering and afraid. And the answer we receive in the words of Holy Scripture, in the eyes and hearts and hands of one another, is the same. Yes. Not only does God care, but God's son Jesus is right in there in the boat with us, in the storm, whether we realize it or not. Amen.